Good morning, welcome to chapel. We are two-thirds done with this semester. And I don't know about you, but I'm just getting started. I am well caffeinated, and I am ready for my day. Um, what gets you out of bed th in this morning? What gets you out of bed this morning? For me, it was the coffee. What is it? Class, class English class. What else? Chapel. Chapel, English class. What else gets you out of bed? Your roommate, Jesus. What gets you out of bed? Well, I am excited to be with you. I am... I love this time of the semester. I feel like it's when we all get really authentic, and it's good to be together in chapel. Right? I'm going to read this scripture. It's Psalms 34. I will exalt the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflictions hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his, whole, his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you, his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of, Lord, of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see more good days, keep the tongue from evil and lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil and blot out their names from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have, made, may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from all of them. He, prote he protects all the bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked, and foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. Our guest today comes for us from outside, a little outside of Seattle, Pat Thompson. You can read more about her and her work in, um, on the sheet you got on the way in. Um, she's the co-founder of the Yes Foundation in White Center, one raised in the community of White Center. Michelle called her the unofficial mayor of, anybody guess? White Center. I hope we're hearing something, a theme here. Um, she has made the place that is foundational for her the place of her mission and work. Um, she has engaged faithfully the lens of Christ in her life's work, and we are proud to have her back. Her honest and forthright and intellectual perspectives have challenged this community in some, some wonderful ways, and she is a forthright Wazoo Cougar devotee, um, which is a courageous position to be made public. Pat Thompson. Oh, thank you, Jess. Hey, it's great to be here. It really is. I'm so, so, so excited. And uh, confession, I was here a couple years ago. Is that right? Yeah, a couple years ago, and I was just like waiting for somebody to invite me back. So thank you. Because <laughs> I really, really like it here. Y'all are good people. And I'm really just very excited to be here. I um, drove down from Seattle this morning. And uh, I originally thought I'd come last night, but it just didn't happen. So I woke up this morning, walked the dog, and, and then, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's another story. I walked the dog, and then I, and then I got in the car, and I came down, and um, a couple things. I have my backpack here, and I don't know, I forgot my computer and my notes for today, which then begged the question, what do you have in your backpack, which was money for Starbucks and lipstick? So, so anyway, I've been kind of putting my, my talk back together again. It'll be fine, I promise. But the other thing that happened that I'm, I don't know, this is kind of exciting to me. Um, a, an old Madonna song popped up on my, my playlist this morning. And um, it was Papa Don't Preach, right? Okay, so this song is like close to 30 years old. Is that right? Papa don't preach, I'm in trouble deep. Papa don't preach. I always thought the next lyric was, I'm on loser street. I never knew. So like years, and I knew it was wrong. I knew it was not exactly right, because it just didn't, right? It just didn't go well. And um, but so whenever the song would come on, I would, I would sing. 
I'm in trouble deep, Papa, don't preach. The, da, da, da. Right? And I wouldn't belt it out like my friends. But today, I heard it. It is, Papa, don't preach. I'm in trouble deep, Papa, don't preach. I've been losing sleep, but I made up my mind. And I was like, psyched. And I looked at the clock. It was 7.30 AM. And I thought to myself, it's not even 8 o'clock, and I have learned something today, right? I'm usually not even awake at 7.30, and I have, yes, I was excited about that. And actually, today, um, we're going to talk a little bit about sort of new paradigms, maybe hopefully a little bit more meaningful than a Madonna song that is older than everybody, I'm sure, in this room. Um, we're going to talk, I, I've, when I saw the theme that you all have been going with this month, is it this month or this quarter, this year, the lens of Christ, I got so jazzed. Because I have been thinking and sort of stewing on this whole lens, vision, sight, seeing. And so when I saw it, I was like, yes! because it's a great thing to be thinking on. And so I, I know that I could learn from your reflections, the things that you have been thinking and talking about on this topic. But some of the things that I've been thinking about as I think about the lens um, and sight is that how we see the world, how we see our quality, the quality of our ability to perceive, this is how our identity comes about more so than actually the object of what you are perceiving. It's your, it's your ability, it's your sensitivity, it's your ability um, leaning into how to understand, how to perceive what you're looking at, how you're looking at it, what you're seeing. And, you know, I have been thinking, well, something really, uh, not devastating, it was actually really exciting this year. I turned 50, right? Yeah, I turned 50 last spring. And um, so... <laughs> And how that comes up in this conversation today is I was thinking about even the internet, even search engines, even Facebook is trying to figure out how I perceive. They are making their money on how I perceive Facebook. And never more was it any clearer to me than when, I don't know, it was probably a month after my birthday, after I turned 50 and I clicked on Facebook and the whole news feed was about menopause. I was like, well, that was subtle, <laughs> right? I mean, are, are you getting those ads about menopause? Yeah, see? <laughs> see? That ain't right! I'm telling you, it ain't right, right? And, you know, I was all ready for the AARP notices to come in the mail. I was ready for that, but, you know, when I'm looking on Facebook to check out my friends and check out the happy things that are going on, and here's this little, you know, news feed issue, just in case you need to know, Pat. Menopause. So... I'm just thinking, you know, th this thing about how we perceive and what the world is able to do with our, how we see, it, we got to get on it. Because if, if the world is kind of using us this way, we need not to be ignorant about it. And I'm thinking about this too. I saw this quote by Mark Zuckerberg, because he was talking about um, the need for, you know, each, each person's Google and Facebook and whatever to be personalized, this is how, the, I know I'm not telling you anything new, you probably know this better than I do, but all this stuff, when you go on your computer, it's personalized to you, it really is, and I, I try to live a transparent life, so I used to not be, I tried not to be bothered by that, you know, that this, I'm being bombarded by ads that are just particularly set out, chosen for Pat Thompson, right? Until I read this quote by Mark Zuckerberg, he says, Zuckerberg. He says, a squirrel dying in front of your house may be more relevant to your interests right now than people dying in Africa. This is how they got us, man. They got us, right? It is something that we got to get on top of. These guys got us, right? If we're not careful. And so I, I come to you no, really curious about what you've been talking about this, this month or this year, the lens of Christ. And also just to, you know, just to propose, let's, let's sort of consider this. Let's not, let's not let people just take us like that, right? I, you know, I try to, li like I said, I try to live transparent life, um, but that's just a little bit too much. So when I click on my computer and the, the thing reboots and there it is, menopause, 
it's just, it's not encouraging, let's just say that. Um, today's verse, we're gonna, there's actually a few passages, different passages that I want to use today, but the overall one that I want to use is 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 6. And I'm like, can we read that together? Okay. The other thing I forgot was my Bible. So Michelle let me use hers, and I'm actually, it's just up here for security, because I'm going to use my, I'm going to use my thing. So let's read it together. Um, do you guys usually do that? Can we do that? Okay, good. Ready? Awesome. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience to the side of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age was blinded of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ our Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this day. Thank you for these people. Thank you for your sight. And we depend on you. We rely on your sight, God. Sometimes um, we're, we're trying to do it on our own or we're trying to sort of navigate our ways um, by only our sight. But today, God, we just really want to depend on you um, and lean into the things that you see about us, the things that you see about our neighbors, the things that you see about our community and our lives. And we ask these things, God, that you would um, be empowered, enabled, and um, just, just move, to move in our lives, God. In Jesus' name, amen. So how is it that we see? Okay, I'm kind of a sucker for pictures. I don't know if, photographs. I love to take them. I love to look at them. I, I am one of those people that sort of spends, I can burn some time looking at some pictures on Facebook, especially like all the cute little children of my friends. I seriously can burn some time. Um, but I love pictures. And actually, I've had this sort of love affair, love for um, pictures, photographs for a long time. And even when I was a kid, which is a long time ago, <laughs> um, when I was 10 years old, my parents gave me a Kodak Instamatic camera. Okay, So it was probably about this, it probably looked about this big. It was thick. And then there was this thing you put on top of it, which was the flash bulb. And it would just like blind everybody, right? And you didn't have to use it, but it, it just kind of stuck on that. It was a separate thing to buy, right? And then you would actually put a cartridge. Um, the cartridge was probably about this, this wide. And you just would stick it in the back. You'd have to open the door here and then stick it in the back. Click it in. And then you'd get 24 exposures on that cartridge, right? And if, you know, if I was big wheel and dealing person, I could get the 36 exposure uh, cartridge, right? So then I would take that, I would take my pictures, I would go into Bartell Drugs, that's the drugstore in my neighborhood, and I would surrender it to the uh, picture department, the camera department, and they would say, come back in four days when your pictures will be developed. <laughs> four days. <laughs> And so I would hand him, literally as a kid, and actually even for as long as that happened, there's a little bit of vulnerability when I would hand over this cartridge of film. Did you ever have to do that? Or are you young enough? Oh, shoot. Is anybody feeling me here? Anyone? Thank you. Gosh, thank you. So every single time I would hand over this cartridge... And I have no idea how they did it. I don't know if they go back there and they just bust it open and just start to... I don't know how it worked. And then they would say, four days. Every day I would just like count down. Oh, is it today? Can I go to Bartels? And I'd have to go take my money. And I was just bummed, right? And then I'd finally, it'd be the day that I would go get my camera, my film. 
which are now pictures. And, you know, I got to be pretty good at taking pictures. So I'd have, depending on, you know, where we were at, like, I took it to camp when I was in sixth grade and took some awesome pictures. But, like, I remember half, more than half my pictures were of the snow-capped mountain, which it, it wasn't all that. I can, at that time, I was like, what? There's nobody in this picture. It's just, it's just a top of a mountain. It wasn't that exciting. So you just sort of learn kind of what you like and, but those pictures were usually pretty good. I usually would get, you know, a good, a good 24 pictures, right? Every once in a while, though, I'd get a, depending on where we would be, what the lighting was like, and where I was, what I was doing, sometimes the whole sort of film would come back under, underexposed or overexposed, really dark, and the pictures would be super, super dark. And oftentimes it'd be at a wedding or something that you want to remember, and you just can't wait to get these pictures and everybody's dark and you can't see the lighting's bad. And I just took for granted that I took a bad picture, right? Oh, I, didn't, I, don't, I don't know how to do this. I took a bad picture. I should have used a flash, what have you. Well, now I realize because of this and because of um, Photoshop, something called Photoshop, and even because, you know, I can get on, even with my other cameras, my bigger cameras, I can get on and Photoshop the thing or change the adjustment. I realize that... Um, it, was, it wasn't that I was taking bad pictures. I was at the mercy of the dude who was on the machine, right? It's his bad. He could have he done something to my pictures, right? Because you guys have done it. You can change your pictures. It's fun to someone like me who sort of suffered through rolls and rolls of film that were just underexposed and you just, I couldn't do anything with it. That's amazing to me that I can actually get on the computer and what was a dark picture is I, I can I can change it. I can bring the light up. I can you know adjust the tint. I can adjust the shadows. I can adjust. It can be warm. It can be cool. It can be this. And I and I, to me that's very fascinating because this image that I thought was real, I, I just thought I was stuck with this image, is now something that I can tweak. Right? Okay. The other thing that I'm thinking about these days is Instagram. So we are so used to filters. Filters are awesome. On Instagram, man, I look good on some of these filters. Because, like, you can take a picture, and, like, you can take a picture of me, and I look at it, I'm like, wow, I look kind of green in that, or that picture sort of brings out my bags. I should have used, ma I should have put on mascara or something. It doesn't work, right? But I can find a filter, because there's like 20. Am I, am I exaggerating? Yeah, there's like 20 filters. If I can scroll through, and I've done it, I can scroll through and find the one that takes the bag, changes the light on it, and takes the bags out from under my eyes or highlights something else. Or you know what else I can do? I can't believe I'm going to tell you this. You maybe do it too, but like I can cut off my face in a way that doesn't make me look fat, right? <laughs> you can just manipulate these pictures. And I think God must think we are... I think these filters exist because we're pretty weak. We can't take to see the truth. We can't handle the truth. So we're constantly going to try to manipulate it through filters, right? And so now I think to myself, when you see an image, when you see a photograph, what you and I used, well, what I used to think was real, it's not real. It's somebody's real. It's somebody who's adjusting colors. It's somebody who's adjusting something. You know, maybe it's you, but it's not real. And this is what I've come to. The whole thing about you shall not worship in a graven image, I get it now. I totally get it. Because the images that we create are not real. And so God is like, don't bow down to that image. It's not real. It's just for a moment half real. As a matter of fact, I thought, well, it's not only, it's, it's, it's not even real for a second. I mean, as soon as you take the picture, it's a lie. It really is a lie. As soon as you take the picture, it's done. It's over. And we think to ourselves, we can sort of capture this moment, this second, right? But as soon as it comes on your iPhone or your smartphone, and as soon as you put a filter on it, you've already tainted the image. We've already distorted images, right? And so how do we remember, you know, you think pictures will help you remember the real? No. It, it helps you remember a version, a distorted of the real. And here's the thing, you, you, can't, un you can't fix it. 
it's, it's always what it's going to be. There isn't anything we can do about that because even if you don't use a filter, it's some, it's a machine taking a picture of what you think of, of what is real. But the moment is the real thing. That, that makes sense. Yeah, the moment is the real thing, not the image. And so now when I think about, gosh, when God said, think about it. don't worship, don't bow down to graven images, I so get it. Here's the other thing I get. Some cultures believe that when you, they don't want you to take pictures of them because they believe there's something that happens to their spirit when you try to photograph them. I, it's not that I thought it was silly, and it's not ever that I just discounted it. It was just something I didn't understand. I get it now. I understand. I understand that. Makes total sense to me, right? And so this is the way that we see it's distorted. It really is, it's distorted. And God knows it. I, I think we're the ones that don't know it. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've had to do a lot of work around that because like I said, I love pictures. So recently, I'm talking about really recent, like the last couple weeks, I've just tried not to take pictures. Because what, what would it feel like for me to, how, how can I really grasp a moment? How can I really, how can I sort of take a mind's eye picture of a moment without a picture, without a photograph, right? Because maybe that will be more real. Living, I mean, I think that's the definition of living in the moment, right? Yeah, yeah. How does God see? without filters. <laughs> Isn't that great? God sees perfectly. He sees everything without filters. Um, I have been inspired and uh, encouraged and challenged by, the, by a Psalm 139. And I'm, I'm going to do it. I teach a Sunday school class of junior high, junior high Sunday school class. And they don't know this, but we're going to memorize this psalm because it's a good one, right? I'm going to read some of it for you. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my, my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The, the night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you, for you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. If I praise you because I am, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for darkness is as light to you. There's that hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Um, Great is thy faithfulness. Um, this is my favorite line. There is no shadow of turning with thee. No shadow. So last June on um, solstice, I went to a retreat um, in, in Seattle with a friend. And the, the retreat topic was light. And so we spent the whole morning and into the, in the noon and then the afternoon day sort of observing and noticing light and how light was coming in, streaming into the room on, you know, on all of us. You know, they, we did a few exercises, but the whole day we were talking about light. 
I was captivated all day long. But one of the things that just sort of got me um, was the noon hour. The noon hour is often called the hour of power. This is why, because when the sun is straight up over us, there are no shadows. And for God, it is noon all the time. There are no shadows. You think about this? In God, there is no darkness. There's no, he doesn't, you can't even say darkness and be serious about it, right? I think about that because, for a lot of reasons, but as I watch my friends and family and, uh, and even myself, and I think about the dark times in my life and in the lives of those who are around me, I, with God, there is no dark, he, darkness does not exist. Because as soon as God is on the scene, it's light, right? This past summer, my mom, I, I live with my mom. Um, and she's 85 years old. And so it's been an interesting thing to watch her in these um, golden years. She wouldn't call it golden years. <laughs> she's trying to exit trust, right? She's, here's a side note. She's got her dress do you know this? She's got her dress set up for her, well, we call it her party day. Call it her party dress, but it's the dress that she's going to meet Jesus in, that dress, right? And uh, she's just ready, right? She's, she's prayed, she's prayed and prayed and prayed. She's ready to go. Anyhow, this past summer, um, she had a little bit, she, she had had some challenges come up, some emotional challenges and some physical um, issues. So we needed to take her into the hospital. And what, what we didn't realize is what we thought was going to be maybe a couple days stay and hopefully get some of her meds recalibrated, right? Turned into a three week in the hospital at a psychiatric ward stay. And then when she came home, there was still some recovery. She still really wasn't herself until probably six, seven weeks. She, there, are good, there are good six weeks of her life that she just does not remember, okay? And as I watched my mom go through this really tough time. Um, she's a very spiritual woman. She has loved Jesus since her childhood. Um, and as I watched where she would go, literally we would come into the room and she wouldn't know. She wouldn't really know what was going on, where she was. She really didn't know where she was. I think we were fortunate that she always knew who we were. She, she always knew her family, but when uh, a few friends from church had come to see her, she, you could see her struggling with who they were, and she was sort of fighting to get to their names, right? But every single day, no matter how rough it was for her, she always knew God. She was always talking about Jesus. She, she actually, she, she used to play bingo a lot. When I was a kid, my mom played, she would just take off and go play bingo. And about, I don't know, probably 20 years ago, I, I'm going to say it was at least 15, maybe 20 years, she just decided I'm not playing bingo, not going to do it, right? But she played bingo a lot. I would go with her, hate the game, okay? But she, that was her game, that was her sport. <laughs> so she, when she was in the hospital, she just kind of reverted sort of a, um, a coping mechanism for her, she would revert to these bingo numbers, right? And so you would be talking to her, and my, my nephew had brought his girlfriend to see her. And um, so they're chatting with my mom, and my mom said, this is the way her conversations would go. True love, true love is good, especially if it's B7. Yeah, B7. That's the number, B7. The row is B, the number is seven. That's how she would talk. And she'd like, she'd pray, you know, and then she'd, she'd say, Lord, um, our Father who art in heaven, I-15, be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, and O-62. I mean, this is kind of her sort of catch way of sort of trying to stay with us, right? That was her way of staying with us. And through, through all, I felt like this is where I learned I'm not going to say dark places anymore. Because I would describe my mom, where she'd go, as dark places. But where she went, Jesus was always there. Always there. Got it. And so she came back and she was talking about Christ. And I will not say dark places because I know 
that there is no place that we can go where Jesus is not already there. Nowhere. The, that thing in Romans 8, nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing. Nothing. I know it because my mom. She was there. God was there with her. There is no darkness in God. There is, he, he does not know darkness. So how do we kind of move to a, a transformed lens, right? The lens of Christ, the lens of the kingdom. I have a couple of proposals here. I think the first thing is you just kind of, you gotta, we have to acknowledge that our lenses are filtered and our filters kind of suck, right? <laughs> They're bad. They're not good filters, right? So you have to, we have to, we have to acknowledge that our lenses are compromised, okay? So the first way I think to do it is you got to pay attention. I'm training my dog, new dog from three weeks ago. He's a big dog. He's like 90 pounds. And I, he has one of those chain collars on him. I didn't like it at first, but I kind of have to have it while I'm training him because he's big, he's strong, and, and I can't control him without it, right? When we're out walking, if he's kind of going off in his own way, I have to kind of yank this chain just to kind of get him to pay attention. Hey, I don't like doing it, but that's the way it has to be done right now. Just, hey, pay attention. We need to pay attention. That's something that God is trying to do with us. He's doing, pay attention, right? Here's another thing. I'm going to try to hurry up. This is probably the biggest thing, I think. I was with my friend John Reed. Michelle knows John. He's a very, very, very talented musician. He I, he's, plays keyboard, super talented, right? And he was telling me something about how he trades chords with people, and this is how he learns. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm not a musician at all. He says, well, you know, when I was growing up, I learned how to play the, the keyboard gospel music, and those are the chords that I learned. I said, oh, there's different chords for different kinds of music. He goes, yeah, Pat, didn't you know? I didn't know, right? And so he'd say, he said, oh, I just would learn the chords of different genres. I go, well, what do you mean? She, he said, well, like Brian McKnight. I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, I said, what does a Brian McKnight chord look like? And he said this. And I go, the difference is you're using nine fingers as opposed to four. He said, yes. I said, how did you learn that? He was taught myself. Listen to Brian McKnight all the time until I, I'm like, oh, that chord's not exactly right. There's one more key, and then I figured it out. But here's the great thing. He would be out somewhere just playing, performing. Other musicians would come up to him and say, hey, those are some pretty cool chords. And John would say, I'll trade you chords. So he would go, they'd go and trade chords. So now John would have gospel, Brian McKnight, R&B, and he would... They would do this thing where they would trade chords. And now he's sort of got this whole beautiful array of different kinds of chords gathered from different genres of music. This is how we, this is how we change our lens, is we have other people diverse from ourselves speaking into our lives, right? You know, I'm a Samoan woman. I'm 50. I'm uh, educated. I'm from a neighborhood where most people are not educated, this is the lens that I see through. I need different people in my life who see through a different lens to inform me so that I'm not just walking around doing this thing by myself on my own. Travel. Mostly though, I think just making sure that God is, that you are acknowledging that God is the one that has the real sight, right? He's real. His sight is real. And when people speak into your life, um, who maybe come from a different place, for me, it's kids. Kids are always telling me what's up, right? They're always telling me some stuff. So I, you know, I, I did a Bible study with this young man. He was seventh grade. I said, hey, I just want to know what you think about this stuff. So we, we started in Genesis, got to, the, got to Noah, got to the ark. He was mad. He was seriously mad. He goes, Pat, what the... What the heck? And I go, what, what's wrong? He said, what? He, the whole world got killed? A bunch of people died, drowned, animals, everything? The whole world got And I'm supposed to be happy about a rainbow. I don't really get that, Pat. I don't get it. Right? Okay. I cannot be intimidated by this. This is a young man who's not afraid to ask questions. I need to stand there and let him ask questions, even though I don't know the answers, right? These are the things that change and seriously sort of mess with our lens. We have to let it happen. We have to not only let it happen, you have to get out there and seek it to happen. Am I out of time? Okay, I'm going to pray.
okay? Lord God, we love you. We love, your, we love the way you see us. Thank you for being generous and gracious and merciful in your sight of us. We depend on you. We love you. And we're going to love each other in your name. Amen.